today. I hope this session could be helpful to, to you. Like I already said, today's theme would be importance of early identification of academic challenges. This webinar is brought to you in association with ISAIN Multisensory Lab. It is an intervention center for children having learning difficulties like dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, ADHD, and autism. It also offers mental health services for all ages. At ISAIN Multisensory Lab, assessment and intervention run hand in hand, as their experts have to say, with the latest and foremost intervention tools and trained mentors, one of which you would be hearing live today in this webinar. So really happy with this association. And I'm pretty sure a lot of attendees must already know about Ability, but to the ones who are attending our webinar for the first time, I would like to repeat that ours is an organization focused on students with special needs and slow learners. It is a platform for parents, special educators, therapists, and schools to craft and collaborate on individualized plans for each student. And Ability is launching focused and affordable live workshops for small groups of parents and special educators. Isn't that exciting? Let me tell you more about these workshops. So how will these workshops help you? Of course, if you are a parent, you can learn from the expert and these workshops will help you, will enable you actually to help your child with increased confidence. Apart from that, since these workshops would be conducted in small groups, there'd be a maximum of 10 people in one single workshop. So that would give you a chance to receive personal attention from the expert and also to address specific challenges. Apart from that, this would not be a one-on-one -on -one session. You would be able to learn together as in learn with and from other parents who are facing similar challenges and difficulties. When other parents would be asking questions, you would learn. And when you would be asking questions, others would learn. So it's a win-win for everyone, isn't it? And not just that, not only the support through the workshop that the experts would be offering, it would also be through additional resources which are very specific to your needs. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you here would be benefiting from these workshops. And on that note, we would like to know what is it like uh, and what are some of the topics where uh, for which you would want to uh, attend these workshops on. So if you could quickly answer this poll for us, that would really be great. Great, I'll keep this poll open for like 10, 20 more seconds. And while all of you are answering that poll for us, I hope that all the ability participants and attendees are aware of how can they access resources from ability. You would be receiving two emails from the ability customer success team after this webinar and also when and after you have registered. So you could go through the instructions in those emails and access all the previous webinar recordings from the past webinars of Ability. Also, these webinar recordings are available on the YouTube channel of Ability. So you can go to YouTube and search for Ability, subscribe to that channel so that you can stay notified for all the upcoming webinar notifications and also some exclusive video content that we would be bringing for you through that channel. And uh, to repeat, we are being broadcasted live on our Facebook channel, www.facebook.com uh, www slash ability. So in case some of your friends or fellow parents are not able to join us live here on Zoom, they can watch the webinar live via Facebook. Okay, so looks like, okay, I'll give you five more seconds because I can still uh, see the numbers uh, increasing at a very fast space. It looks like a lot of you are answering this question. I'm excited to see the enthusiasm for workshops. Uh, we would keep you posted as and when we announce the workshop series. Okay, so I would end the poll now. Thank you so much for your response. And I also wanted to mention if the topics mentioned here uh, uh, 
uh, does not include the topic that you want to attend a workshop on, please feel free to send in your suggestions via the chat box. You can also write to us at supportability.com and also you can record your suggestions in the feedback form, which you which we would be sharing post the webinar. Thank you so much for your response. Okay, so talking about the lady of the day, Dr. Deepa Raja, who is the founder of iSane Multisensory Lab. She's a medical practitioner with over a decade of experience in dyslexia and learning difficulties. Her own son was diagnosed with dyslexia 17 years ago. And this particular fact took her on a journey from a struggling mother to an intense guide and therapist. Apart from the numerous academic degrees, achievements and certifications against her name, she is also a member of the British Psychological Society, Dyslexia Guild UK and Maharashtra Dyslexia Association MDA. She's been a regular speaker at various conferences such as Special Education Show London, GESS Dubai. She has also represented India to speak on the impact of technology in special educational needs at BET Asia Leadership Summit. We are truly, truly grateful to have you here with us today, Dr. Deepa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Great. So without further ado, I'm extremely sorry for the technical glitch. If you were not able to see me uh, all this while, my sincere apologies. Uh, we were trying to broadcast live and I think so there was some issue there. But never mind. Uh, I hope Dr. Deepa would take over from here today. And uh, so let's hear from her. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepa. Once again, and over to you. Namaste, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Swati. I'm really humbled by, uh, you know, such an amazing introduction. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much, Ability, you know, for um, having this uh, webinar because it's going to reach out to so, so, so many uh, parents and teachers who have been struggling like me. You know, so I'm very happy to reach out to as many as possible. It's anyways, uh, you know, even a Dyslexia Awareness Month. And, uh, you know, let's try and reach out uh, to more and more people to realize and to spread awareness on importance of early identification of academic difficulties. All right, then um, we start from here. So we're going to start, I'm going to take you to a journey uh, from what is learning. So what is learning? Are you listening to me right now? You are. Okay. How are you listening to me? You are listening to me attentively. I hope so. Right. So any, any information which you need, you need to be attentive to get that information. Right. So then that is the first pillar of learning. What happens then? When you get any information, putting on to a lot of attention, you put that information or you perceive that information according to your own understanding. So the second pillar of learning is perception. Everybody perceives information in a different form. They have their own individual form to perceive any information coming to them. After the information is perceived, the, the information goes to the memory. Now, how many types of memory do we have? Okay, try and recall. So the first is short-term memory and the second is the long-term memory. Okay, here I'm going to add two more memories. The first is going to be a sensory memory, then a short-term memory, then a working memory, and then a long-term memory. So the sensory memory's work is to have the stimulus on us or on our brain for three seconds. Okay, a short term memory uh, gives you a better uh, time frame and it stays on our brain or on the, to the memory part for 30 seconds. During the 30 seconds, you have to decide which information is more important or is it important for you? And then how do you put it up onto the long term memory? 
So if I may just simplify that, it's going to be a short-term memory is a shelf and a long-term memory is your cupboard. Uh, I am going to give you a phone number right now. You know, uh, you may you may write it in the chat later on, and uh, Swati can definitely check it. So it's nine eight two four zero four two nine two nine. How you remember is going to be your task. Okay. Uh, talking about working memory, just a brief elaboration on working memory. Working memory is if you do a sort of a mental math, like seven plus two, uh, nine, nine minus three. Uh, six, six into six. No, this is where you're actually storing an in information for some time, manipulating it, and then expressing it. Okay, so this is a brief on uh, types of memories we are going to use in future. The last one, very important, is expression. Expression can be oral, expression can be written. Major part of us, we uh, try and look at child's uh, performance through written abilities or reading abilities. Uh, so here, I'm just going to give you a brief definition on what is attention. It is a concept that refers to how we actively process specific information in our environment. Perception enables us to make sense of the world around us. So it is awareness or an understanding of something you know, that is around us. Uh, as I shared about three sorts of four sorts of memory. Uh, perception and the memory. So short term, sen sensory, short term, working and long term. And the last one is expression. Here I would want to add on that your brain is capable of storing seven plus minus two chunks um uh, as earlier i gave you the phone number how would you remember you know there are there are a lot many uh, strategies which we use to remember that one could be repetition um one could be you know we say okay nine eight two four zero two like that so that is called chunking now how elaborate you chunk is according to your own wish or your capability Right? So your brain is capable of storing seven plus minus two chunks. Um, yeah, coming to the point on what is learning difficulty, I would also wish to share that this is a very, 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 very vast topic, you know, but we have just tried to combine as much as possible, which you can actually take home and which is more effective for children you're working with you know so there could be many things which would not be here but we have just tried to combine it as much as possible okay so what is learning difficult um if you go through all the four slide or all the four pillars of learning you would realize okay the first one was attention um so issues with attention the child struggles with attention. Then there are issues with ADD, ADHD. So we term them as attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Uh, the second one is perception. Now perception is where major language processing is done when a child is learning. So you, you learn decoding skills, you learn words, you learn phonemes, you, you learn blends. Everything is done onto that area of perception. So if there is an issue in the perception, then you can have learning difficulties like dyslexia. So there are issues with words, sounds, memory, and sequencing. The other part uh, which you're able to see is dyspraxia. I would just want to you know, brief you about there is where a child struggles through motor coordination. So it's a more of a gross motor, fine motor coordination where a child is suffering from. Okay, so we term as, and if you, you must have seen some children in your own environment figuring out that, you know, they tend to fall immediately. You know, if they, you've given them some sort of books, a pencil, but it, it tends to just fall out of their hand without their fall, fall, you know, and they realize that, okay, I'm not doing anything, but it's just falling. So, you know, that is what is more of dyspraxia. 
Uh, dysphasia is more of speech issues uh, when a child is struggling with speech. And dyscalculia is where a child is struggling more with mental calculation and numbers. Now, don't let the term learning difficulties or disabilities mislead you, teachers and parents. Rooted with this term is a common assumption that children with learning difficulties or disabilities can't learn. As I shared earlier, what happens is that we generally try and gauge the children through more of their reading or writing skills. Now, a child who has issues with learning or with reading or with writing, it is very difficult for us to realize that he can, he or she can be good at certain other things. So guys, please keep your mind open. Children with learning difficulties or disabilities are not dumb or lazy. In fact, they usually have average to above average intelligence their brain just processes information differently, right? So now I'm going to give you, give you some task as well before I give you um, some more tips. All right, um, so you will have to try and read this. I can give you not more than five seconds. Um, you know, Swati will be having a tick tick, um, you know, on me saying we'll have to rush up. All right, so even I'm trying along with you. It's like, I am an American. I was born in, and read um, in Hatford in the state. How many of you are tired? Tell me how many of you are really tired. Can you imagine the trauma, the stress, which is happening while reading this paragraph? This exactly happens with children having reading difficulties or writing difficulties. And they are asked to read, you know, when they're not able to connect to what is being taught. That is the trauma they face on every term. Here again, I would want to tell you, you know, you, many of you, your, your educators, um, you know, and you would tell me that, uh, but uh, the actual reading is from left to right. And here you're reading from right to left. How can that be possible? But here I'll tell you, when we learned reading, it was also stated that, you know, beginning of the sentence, you put a capital letter. Now here, uh, when I was trying to read or making sense of what is given to me, there was a capital letter on the right hand side, right? So I was just trying to um, read or make sense out of something which is given to me from the right hand side of the paragraph. In terms of reading or in that stress of reading, I could not actually comprehend. I could only read a bit, figuring out, okay. And then I had to, you know, take a lot of time and a like, lot of, it was a lot of toiling for me coming from right to left. I am an American. So this is what a child, you know, stresses out every day in the classroom when they are not able to connect. They just try to connect whatever is easier for them, you know. So they'll either take it from right. This is where you see a lot of left, right confusion. So please, please, please realize this trauma, you know, take this home. Um, generally, when we are doing um, physical training, what happens is that more than 50% uh, of teachers or parents who are there as an audience would actually live it. They would say, oh, uh, you know, we're done. We can't go, go any further. Now, how can you uh, expect the same from the child that you want? No, no, no. If this is not happening, you have to do this. You know? So please have that with you. So here, what we're trying to tell you is, um, you know, uh, which is quoted by Albert Einstein very rightly, that everybody is a genius. 
But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid, right? You can't do that because the strength of a fish is in swimming. Why is early identification important? This is a very important question. Here I have realized that during my practice years, you know, uh, there are many parents and teachers would come up with, uh, you know, an argument saying that, uh, no, I, you give them a reputation, you try a little bit more, you know, give them some more time um, and they should be able to do it. No, don't waste useless time. If you feel there is an issue, you should go for help immediately, you know. So why it is important? Let's just run through that. Bill Gates has rightly said um, that early years are very important for brain development. The first five years have so much to do with how the next 80 will turn out. Now, brain is more plastic or flexible, you know, in the first five years of life. The more you exercise uh, different areas of the brain in the early development, the more that is why early identification, early intervention. Early experiences affect the nature and the quality of the brain's developing architecture. Right? So neuroplasticity is better when a child is in kindergarten. It is little difficult when the child gets older. Late intervention takes more time and get harder and harder. Now, when early intervention is delayed, like, like I said, you know, many teachers and many parents would come with an argument that we should give them some more time. You know, it's a skill. Uh, people will learn. You know, this has happened since years. But no, what happens, I'll tell you. When early intervention is delayed, it takes four times as long to intervene in fourth grade as it does in late kindergarten because of the brain development or neuroplasticity, as I shared. And increase in the content for the student who learn as they grow older. Right? This was uh, shared by National Institute of Child Health and Development. Now what happens? That a child is, is still struggling in the basic foundation skills. Okay, And we're still trying to give them some more time saying, okay, we'll give them some more time and they will do it. At the same time, the child is also moving from kindergarten to grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. Now, imagine in grade one, there's a content. In grade two, the content increases. Grade three, the content further increases, but the child's skills are still there. So can you imagine the gap which escalates? We need to move to prevent instead of remediate. You know, we need to move to that model. You know, we should prevent these learning difficulties or academic difficulties, you know, rather than coming up to a remediation model. Um, to the extent that we allow children to fall seriously behind at any point during early elementary school, we are moving to a remedial rather than a preventive model of intervention. Once children fall behind, it may require very, very intensive intervention because of the large amount of reading practice that is lost by children each month and year that they remain poor readers. You know, this is very devastating for children. And then what happens is they have low self-esteem and are likely to predict the worst. You know, they feel they're being judged. They feel uh, they judge negatively and they start comparing themselves less favorably with peers and siblings. Uh, anxiety and hopelessness and depression is along with them then. Uh, yes, why early, uh, early identification is important. Um, uh, if you can, again, I'm giving you a lot of reading uh, assignments, you know, so you need to try this for sure. Um, and then I'm going to tell you that this is, uh, you know, it, it will take more time again. Uh, anyways, you will be getting this home. So definitely try this. We went and played with our friends 
Tonk had Tim boxes. There's a lot. But I would want to share here that this is a writing piece. And, and not, to, not to miss out, did you see what he's drawn? The child has drawn himself. There are tears in the eyes. Right? So can you imagine what a child is also going through inside? This is actually a writing piece of a grade seven child, you know, uh, who was not identified earlier. Now look at this work and now come up with an intervention plan. How are we going to remediate this child? How do we start an intervention with him? Imagine the gap, you know, you imagine the gap. So please don't waste time. Don't let children go through this level. Importance of early identification and intervention. Early intervention services are highly effective and can support in closing the achievement gap. You know, it helps in developing a positive self-concept, enjoying reading and school, reaching their maximum academic potential and preventing dropouts. You know? Identification should begin as early as kindergarten. Screening and assessment is important at an early stage so that we can create positive learning channels for children. You know, what happens is that um, we again argue that, uh, you know, we cannot uh, assess them till they start uh, learning to read or, you know, we, we fear in going for an assessment, you know, but I feel it should be actually taken healthy. You know, identification or um, uh, identification is more a child centric. You know, we're trying to figure out a child's profile of strengths and weaknesses by getting them onto an identification model of screening or assessment. You know? So rather than considering them to be lazy, you know, uh, we need to understand the real underlying issue the, and, and then work for that cause. Yes, um, this was a very important question and we thought we have to do this. How to identify and intervene early? You know, as I said, there are many parents and teachers who will argue, but they will agree to this point when they, when they come to a consensus that identification is very important at an early stage to come up for a positive intervention plan. Yes, we have, um, you know, we have given along with this uh, age appropriate checklist, which we have created over a period of time and with the practice, we have again tried to keep it concise so that it's more easily understandable and we have not tried to use more of the technical language. Um, so the first checklist is for kindergarten. Uh, the second one is from grade one to three. Uh, the third one is from grade four to six. Now, um, what we would request you is that you need to observe a child's persistent behavior for at least six months you know, before you put a yes tick onto uh, the checklist which we have provided. Uh, the scoring would again require uh, that if you feel that there are, you know, almost 50% uh, is ticked, you know, you need to realize that there is some gap and you need to go for the cause of it. If you realize that the, the uh, you know, the ticks are almost 75 percentage, you definitely need to go and meet uh, the professional on this. So I strongly suggest that, you know, definitely take an intervention. We would be coming to a, a point where we would be sharing a few interventions, which you can do at home, but don't wait long. Um, early identification and intervention, um, what happens, like I will share in the ideal plan with you people. Uh, generally, what happens is that uh, uh, there is an observation, you know, by parents on a day-to-day -day level that you see, at, uh, uh, you would realize that, oh, my child is not walking, but the other's child is still uh, has started walking and there's a speech delay. Uh, he's still not started uh, speaking up and it's been two and a half years, but the others, others are actually speaking. So the first observation could be by the parents, also by the teachers and the carers. Uh, after you observe this, there is a checklist for parents and teachers also. So you need to fill this up. The third part would be screening 
an assessment by professional. Why screening and assessment? Again, as I shared, that screening is more child-centric. We are trying to recognize a profile where a child is having, you know, what are his strengths and what are his weaknesses and how can we actually, uh, you know, try and bridge those gaps. Uh, the third one is, I mean, the, the fourth one is intervention plan. Once you really know a profile of a child, this is his strength, this is his weakness, uh, we are able to form an intervention plan directly directed to bridge the gap. That is why screening and assessment are important. A reevaluation is very, very, very important to realize that your intervention plan is targeted directly on a child. You know, so this is extremely important. Um, in our day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, life uh, at our center, we're actually associated with many schools, and that's what we do. Is we actually train the teachers uh, how to identify children and what are learning difficulties and everything, and then we give them the checklist. Then the checklists are filled by the teachers when they, the extreme ones are sent for screening and assessment immediately. You know, we don't wait, okay? But on a positive note, and there are intervention plans targeted for a particular child. This is one of the, um, you know, examples. All right, so um, early identification, why early identification and intervention? How does intervention in the process of screening, assessment, and reevaluation differ? I think I shared this, but um, you know, there's a slide, and I have to just go through it. So, their intervention is more explicit, more systemic, more intensive, and more supportive. Right? That is why I've been after like screening and assessment and reevaluation. You know? That is why I've been emphasizing on that. Um, this is a, a brief, um, you know, a picture of the screening which we use, and and you know, just if I if I give you a brief idea of the scoring, what happens is that the first one is the missing pieces. Missing pieces is a non-verbal test. You know, now non-verbal tests, uh, none of the language is used. You know, when you're screening for missing pieces, the child is falling into an average. Piece. Uh, the word sounds majorly assesses the phonological awareness of the child, all right? And that, that falls into a below average category. Spelling is below average. Visual search is more of a processing speed, which we uh, assess. That is again on the average range. The reading is on the below average range. So if I just give you a the child is intelligent. A child has good nonverbal skills, uh, but he struggles with the phonological awareness. So let's look at the gap. So you need to focus your area, your intervention, your plans on um, emphasizing and teaching them phonological awareness in different ways or in a multisensory way. The major question, again, I, I answered this and I also gave the question to this was, is it possible to diagnose and prevent reading and writing before a child can read? Yes, right? Uh, there are many, 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 uh, you know, uh, reliable tests also available uh, from starting of three years. Okay, so don't worry about that. Uh, we'll go through a list of how can we identify it so that it is easier for you to connect to the checklists which is given to you. And when you go home and read it, it's going to make more sense. Um, visual special characteristics. They have auditory difficulties. They have um, concerns with sequencing and memory. They struggle in motor coordination. They have academic characteristics, which again is going to be coming. Uh, case and family history of somebody having some issues, you know, in the past, both paternal and maternal families. There will be behavior issues. There could be anger and aggressive tendencies and there could be socio-emotional concerns. For all characteristics, you know, a child confuses the sounds. You know, if you're teaching them uh, rhyme, you know, he confuses, he gets confused. Uh, here, again, if I want to, you know, go back to the four pillars of learning, what happens is that a child is using the first pillar, he's trying to 
get the sound with attention getting on to the perception uh, using his memory right but there is a difficulty so the child gets confused that is poor sound blending ability there is difficulty in repeating polysyllabic words the long words you know which has more syllables there is difficulty in repeating digits in reverse order now digits in reverse order um, i would want to put it again that you use your working memory okay? because you put your number you reverse it and then again you express it a uh, difficulty in following oral instruction here you know i just want to add on uh, a little bit on um, uh, you know a part called plenum temporal which is involved with processing language it is a smaller triangular um, you know area situated in the left hemisphere now in 65% of population plenum temporal is more developed in children with uh, academic difficulties it has been observed to be symmetrical uh, in both the hemisphere and thus there is a traffic jam of uh, you know the language and the processing so can you imagine like b if i have the proper set of plenum temporal i know that this b is going to be like this but if there is a confusion sometimes b becomes b right uh, um i'm sorry i think i skipped one slide and we we'll just go back to that um, you know how to identify visual special characteristics so it's persistent reversals of letters Uh, syllables and words there are mirror imaging of letters there are jerky eye movements uh, there is normal visual acuity uh, possible abnormal pupil dil dilation we also actually ask um, you know children to get um, their eyes checked you know that is also you know everything uh, gives us the point where we don't want to harass children or we want them to you know go to the positivity completely yeah we'll go down now have your attention is I said page thirty-eight, chapter four, paragraph three. Read the first sentence and point out the adjective. Page thirty-eight, Ishan. Adit Laba, just help the boy. Come on, the rest. ये तो नाच रहे स्पीक इन इंग्लिश द लेटर्स आर डांसिंग दे आर डांसिंग आर दे ओके देन रीड द डांसिंग लेटर्स ट्राइंग टू बी फनी रीड द सेंटेंस लाउड एंड प्रॉपर I said loud and proper, Ishan. Loud and proper. Loud and proper. Very loud. Right. All right. What did you see? Did you see what a child is facing? Hmm? Yeah. This is this is what happens. You know. So if we if we go through again another difficulties, um, it's sequencing and memory characteristics, persistent disordering of any series, 
inability to encode, process, retrieve, or auditory or linguistic material, right and left confusion, short term memory difficulties, directional confusion, up and down confusion, yesterday and today or tomorrow confusion, difficulties in estimating time, you know, they are unable to estimate what time it is, a confused word order in speech, and difficulty with mental arithmetic. So many difficulties, right? Uh, motor coordination, uh, you know, they're clumsy, they're accident prone, as I shared, you know, in early when I was um, talking about all those circles, uh, dyspraxia, restless or hyperactive, they have group, poor graphomotor skills, which affects a lot of uh, writing, uh, handwriting is messy, poorly structured, illegible, immature, they have abnormal reflexes, they have finger differentiation problem, lack of cerebral dominance, again, because of, it could be because of plenum temporal, of course. Uh, you realize that they are actually orally capable. Um, and there is discrepancy between the brightness and the school progress. You know, when, they, when you ask them orally the questions, um, they would be fine, but... Um, when it comes to you know the, the formative or summative assessments, it's very difficult. Has difficulty generalizing, acquiring, and applying rules. You know, they're disorganized. Um, written expression is very difficult. They don't remember the sequence. Uh, reading and spelling, again, below the ability level. Uh, hi, Dr. Hi. Looks like there is uh, the video is still playing. Maybe I think we need to switch to the PPT. I think we are not seeing the PPT. All right, we'll try. Yeah, is it visible now? I think it's starting to, yeah, thank yeah, you. We're starting to see, All right. thanks. Okay. All right, so academic characteristics, the variability within IQ scores, severe spelling disorders, um, you know, they have difficulty memorizing tables in sequencing instructions. Um, they have low frustration thresh threshold, you know, and they still need a lot of aids and a lot of prompting. Uh, continuing with uh, academic characteristics, they have issues with number sense, memorization, accurate and fluent calculation. Is it, are they asking plus? So they get confused with plus and minus and multiplication, you know. It, and when it comes to word problem, it's much more difficulty. Difficulties um, with spelling and poor handwriting, you know, they're on your screen, um, you see, um, you know, uh, an example of what has happened, you know, uh, it has poor spellings, the child's getting frustrated, you know, and this is, um, this is a child who, who was actually in the school, you know, which we were catering to. So I thought we would want to share this, how difficult it is for them to put it up on paper. And then we don't want to give them more time on this, right? We want to give them help. Family history, uh, here family history and taking family history is very, very important. More than 10% of children having learning difficulties have strong familial link. You know, it, it, it could be genetic. Um, history of any illness by the mother during pregnancy, if I may quote, so there could be a rubella infection or so, during the pregnancy, the mother could be infected or the mother could have got, um, you know, have taken a high dose of drugs or alcohol, you know, that could affect the fetus. History of major fall or trauma of the mother. Uh, even the birth history is very important. You know, we have uh, realized that when we take up uh, children and when we take up a detailed history, there, there would be some parents coming and say, no, mom, ma'am, we don't have an issue. No, the child has an issue. I said, yeah, but this is very, very important to understand a child from its core, you know, so history of major fall or trauma, even the birth history of a child, was it a normal birth or was it a full term? Uh, was it a cesarean? Was it a forcep? You know, was it a genetic or during the forcep there could have been, a, you know, a damage um, in the child's uh, brain. So even major illnesses of a child during initial years, that is also very important for us. Taking into consideration developmental milestones is at most important, you know, did he crawl or not? When did he sit? When did he walk? When did he speak? You know, 
all these things are very important behavior we also realized you know when we saw the video also we realized that the child is actually going through a lot of issues none of them are able to understand what's going on inside the child and then they'll have low self esteem uh, lack of confidence poor social skills they'll be angry they'll completely lack of interest in studies um i would want to share here that uh, you know when we went to uh, you know british dyslexia association conference that is a meeper was actually used as a basic foundational uh, film to understand the impact you know so this is very very important uh intervention so what do you do you know a major question like the 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 crux is okay intervention so when you see some of the areas of concern what can you do next the first thing i'm telling you as a mother as a therapist accept your child okay accept the fact that there is something going on with the child inside you know be there to help him or her without judgments just don't judge them okay don't look at the child as a victim you know there could be some intervention we all are really uh, you know in the in, in the in the era of google if you google there are few interventions here and there available and uh, you realize that uh, you know this is there or this is not i would definitely put to your notice that it is very important to choose the right kind of intervention you know so try out the safest one and if you feel the gap is less that's fine but if you feel the child is not improving please don't waste the time talking about continuous uh, you know uh, difficulties let us tell our children that we will go ahead towards the journey of we can you know don't don't just let on you know don't just pat them down but we can tell them no we will go we can do it together talking more about uh, you know we we talked a lot about uh, difficulties now let's talk more about strengths how many of oh, all right we'll go first through the pointers and then i'm going to ask you one question again uh yes children with dyslexia all learning difficulties have average to above average iq i'll go a little quicker on this because the slide is going to be with you uh they are uh, picture thinkers they have a three division they have good special knowledge they could be good business entrepreneurs they're very creative they can think outside the box you know they have strong reasoning uh, skills and many more uh, now i'm sure many of us are using iphone am i correct all right so iphone is um, you know is is who found who founded the iphone or the apple steve jobs and he is on the famous personalities with dyslexia this is more on to give you a positive impact on that the difficulties are there at its own place but we need to focus on the strengths and that is where we focus more on screening and assessment and a structured intervention you know, structured intervention um yeah there are supportive laws of sen all across uh, all the countries have their own support uh, supportive laws for special education and needs you know in um, recently government of india is strongly supporting uh, you know children with learning disabilities uh, they have amended the 2016 rights of persons with disabilities and all the boards you know it could be igcse it could be ib uh cbsc in india if i'm talking uh, but all across you know the, the boards have been very supportive and they're working more towards an inclusive society i uh, yes so um all right so shoot your questions thank you so much dr deepa <laughs> Uh, dear participants, you can send in your questions via the chat box. Uh, uh, we would shortly be beginning with the Q and A session, and like Dr. Deepa was discussing about the checklist, and she definitely said checklist can be the first step 
towards early identification. So what we would be doing for today's webinar attendees, we would be sharing a link in the chat box. Shortly, you would receive the link. And what you need to do is you need to sign up using that link and fill the checklist based on the observations of the past six months. Remember, these are grade specific checklists. So you need to enter the grade of your child correctly before starting to answer the questions. This checklist has been created and curated by the experts at uh, ISAIN Multisensory Lab. And after you have completed filling the checklist, you would be receiving recommendations within five working days. These recommendations would include activity sets or you know intervention key that you can use for the challenge areas with your kid. Or otherwise, you could always consult a professional if there's a need to do so based on the checklist responses. So uh, do check out the list in the chat box right now. And either you can save the link or you can save it for later. I have shared the link once again with all of you to access. Yeah. So without further ado, Dr. Deepa, we have received hundreds of questions, you know, from our webinar uh, registrants and attendees also. Uh, people, you can keep the questions coming in the chat box. Meanwhile, let me ask you some of the most important ones and the most oh. common ones rather. Yeah. So we all saw the video uh, of Ishan from the movie Tare Zameen Par. And every time uh, we see that video, or for that matter, I see that video, my heart yeah. wrenches with pain. So, yeah. and a lot of parents have asked us regarding that, that how can we identify dyslexia early? And, you know, some of the parents have also asked if the mirror image problem like B and D, P and Q, yeah. is it a red flag? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, for this, uh, the general system is that, um, you know, by uh, the kindergarten level, uh, a child should be able to learn all the letter sound relationship, you know, but by the end of kindergarten, if a child is unable to, uh, you know, get a niche onto a letter sound relationship, there should be a red flag. You know, after that, going forward, if there is a left right confusion, a child should be able to write by third year, you know, when they've started uh, uh, given the writing, uh, uh, the, the writing abilities. So they should be able to write at least all the alphabets. If they are not able to do it, we should wait for six months. But then again, you should, uh, you know, contact or uh, get some help. Uh, here, mirror image, uh, as you asked, is not always the only predictor. You know, it's not always the only predictor. There has to be many more added uh, symptoms or added signs along with this also. Because if there is a mirror image, we generally give them some time till five years of age because then we give them some small intervention like we use a uh, multi-sensory technique. So we use a sand paper letter, uh, you know, teaching them um, uh, the letter sound relationship or the letters in that sense, or there's a tray of sand and then you, you know, trace the letter into them. So we use more of the multi-sensory. Um, if you remember, as I shared that there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, perception area where we're working on. So you're using all your five senses to strengthen your perception of language. Um, the other thing is, uh, yes, the, there's a checklist also which has been given and there is a lot of information which we have, uh, you know, on the website also. So, you, you know, if there's an issue, if you feel that you need some more information, you can also go on the website. Sure. I'm uh, hopeful that the checklist helps and uh, we would also Absolutely. be sharing additional resources on our website yes. via blog. Yes. And you can also yes. visit uh, ISAIN Multisensory Labs website to check out how yeah. you can intervene early. Yeah. Okay. And how maybe you can identify uh, dyslexia early. Okay. Now that we have discussed how can we identify dyslexia early, in case if uh, the parents are not observant enough, how can we identify dyslexia in a classroom setup? Just like we were seeing Ishan's video once again, uh, in a classroom setup when more than 40 or 50 students are being addressed at the same time, what can be done to identify dyslexia? See here, um, on a very honest note, what happens is that, that this has to start with a very empathetic, uh, sensible, sensitive teacher. 
you know who observes a, who observes a child in the classroom setting that there is something wrong with the child because if he or she is continuously with the teacher the teacher would be able to identify that okay if orally he is fine you know he is able to speak but why isn't he able to uh, write correctly um or there there could be other parameters where a, where a teacher is feeling that either he's socially you know his behavior is changing he's easily distracted in the class why is it happening you know all those things and it always starts with uh, you know with a a sensitive mother or a or a or a teacher you know in the classroom setting and this is where we have actually started training a lot of teachers you know this has been our uh, our major area that we want to spread this awareness so much Uh, that you know everybody has a as a knack of that okay this is it this is it and we should be helping a child you know and this is not just a therapy speaking i have been like uh, onto a very struggling journey as a mother you know for my child so you realize that if your teacher is knowing this early uh, you know this is very very important for a child sure i definitely agree uh, we need sensitive teachers more and yeah. more and though that awareness needs to spread Okay. that's where ability so, is also working for for a lot of things <laughs> definitely definitely and uh, we are hopeful that this awareness spreads far and wide through our efforts or anyone else's as long as the message is uh, spread across Absolutely. it's more than helpful for all the kids out there okay Absolutely. we have been talking about early identification a lot today so uh, and that is the theme of the webinar actually a lot of parents have asked us what is the ideal age range for diagnosing learning difficulties uh see i would actually start with 2 and 1/2 years right <laughs> <laughs> you know if it's early it has to be real early why do you want to waste time you know but again here you have to look out for your red um, antenna you know when you realize that the child has not crawled so for example if we say the child has not crawled so crawling actually happens at uh, at 6 to 8 months you know during the developmental phase So if you realize that the child has not crawled, and then later on there are issues with his cross laterals or left right, uh, there's a confusion. You know, a parent needs to realize, okay, the the child has not crawled, and then this this is an issue. So by the time it's two and a half or three, and the child has already been on to a playhouse and have been learning, there are issues you need to go for. Uh, you know a screening. Again, as I shared, you know, screening is nowhere into finding faults. You know, we're not there to find faults. Uh, we're there to actually figure out saying that this is a gap let's just do it asap you know that is a major crux uh, from fifth year uh, you can start having uh, even formal assessments and you have formal assessments at two and a half at at three years everything is just available right now and as i said they we use a lot of technology also you know so it is much more easier for us to screen a child you know and the child is still feeling that i'm i'm playing a game right you know i'm i'm just playing a game when you are you're actually assessing my child you know, so lots has happened in the area a lot of things have come up totally yeah i definitely agree <laughs> the earlier the better and if you can start early to and half years better. is as good enough absolutely. right absolutely absolutely okay and uh, like we have shared the checklist the link for assessing cha- uh, checklist to our participants and attendees uh some of the chat box questions that i could read uh was also this that if while filling the checklist uh parents some of the parents don't understand some of the questions or you know the observation that has been listed there what should they do so how can we help them better um yeah so so immediately there are two things swati which we can do um you know either the the whole thing has been there on our website also you know the details so it's drdeepraja.com or they can actually contact you and us and we can help them uh, the other thing is that um, you know initially i shared that when they're filling up the checklist and there is you know 50% or more yeses you know you need to worry a little if there's 75% yeses you need to worry a little bit more Right. Uh, right so we've tried actually you know we've tried to make it as simple as possible but there is a lot of information like it's really last year we actually made a small booklet like this you know right. and we actually give give them give them out so that you know it's much more easily accessible for the parents also to understand what we we're talking about you know? but this is also available on the website so you can do that also yeah 
that must definitely be helpful so like dr deepa said you could reach us to uh, reach out to us you could write us to support@ability.com and apart from that if there are general terms there is plenty of information available right there on the internet so google some of the terms to understand those observations better and then you can record your responses accordingly so that i hope uh, would help you dear parents so we're talking about the checklist if the parent identifies areas of challenges using the checklist what could they try doing at home before they actually you know uh, speak to a professional absolutely so we have tried and categorized the checklist in terms of the four pillars again you know which right. which we've learned today okay right. so the first one was attention so if there are issues with attention uh, we tend to use a lot of sensory integration therapy you know which consists of brain gym and learning gym so there's a right. set of small exercises you know which is again uh, available and uh, which is also available on our website but it's also available on net you know right um so then you can start working on that there could be a lot of uh, you know even bharatnatyam helps you know learning oh. bharatnatyam helps uh, yoga wow. and meditation wow. you can also uh, put them on to uh, because a child having uh, you know a lot of hyperactivity will need to shed off that uh, energy you know sure. for that you will either have to use a lot of your knee you know and uh, you can have exercises according to that uh, or you can also put them onto a physical uh, you know exercise regime yeah this was a, a complete new piece of information for me bharat natyam helps so uh, dear parents you might never know what are some of the activities that you know can help your child so seek professional help ask the experts attend these webinars and hopefully you all would be able to find some ways or others to help your child better okay yeah. dr deepa so sorry parents... sorry, oh, sorry. Swati, just to add on the perception part you know i'll just put it up across uh, oh you know, i'm actually I, sorry yeah. yeah as we shared about the the sandpaper letters you know we also use uh, you know how to teach your brain uh, you know reading so uh, right. we, we can uh, you know parents can easily use uh, all the vowels in red color you know they put their okay. vowels in red color and then they put like if it's a cat a c is in a pencil a is a vowel so that could be in red and then t could be in pencil again you know this also works wonders so this is again a very simple doable uh, things which we can do right 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 these simple activities could go a long way yes. definitely yeah. Yeah. a lot of parents uh, dr deepa have uh, told us have mentioned forgetfulness and uh, they have observed that uh, the kid does not remember what he or she has memorized two or three days ago so what could possibly be the reason for this and how can they help their child in this regard um yeah so there could be issues with memory now uh, actually we have a lot of memories but uh, to focus on the learning we're going to focus more on these four types of memories as i shared sensory uh, short term and working memory and long term memory so there could be that the child is facing issues with his or her working memory and it's not able to you know retain the the information uh, so there could be two things we can also uh, intervene them or do a lot of repetition it has a structured repetition till the information is kept on to the long term memory cupboard now or you give them a memory connection so some with some children we also give them the a band you know which you gives you a memory connection so the information the connection it will again you know get you up to that memory um, part in the storage and it will try to retrieve it but here but here again i would suggest that it's always better to know a child individually again Um, these are all very common and generalized uh, interventions which we are actually offering right now because it's a group but we should always go with a, a child centric intervention plan you know every individual is is completely different yeah definitely every individual every child is completely different yeah. and if we could take that uh, child centric 
approach, we would be able to help the child better. But uh, I really hope that some of the advices being shared by you here today with the parents can help uh, most of the children. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have been receiving these questions repeatedly uh, throughout our webinars and I would like you to answer that once again for us. What is the difference between a learning difficulty and a learning disorder? <laughs> uh, difficulty is, as, as I said, you know, it is a very, um, uh, it's sort of a mild to moderate. <laughs> Disorder right. goes on to the severe level. Right. You know, difficulty could be in one or two of your uh, learning um, parameters or learning skills. You know, disorder is a permanent, permanent disruption of that uh, learning pattern. You know, so in learning disorder, there could be a severity, um, you know, of the learning channels. You know, it has been disrupted very severely. Right. But recently what has happened is that um, recently people have refrained from using learning disabilities and that they tend to use learning difficulties, you know, to be more positive. So here again, we have to... Figure out like uh, like we shared, uh, uh, you know, a dyslexic. What is the difference between a dyslexic child and a slow learner? You know, we tend to generalize the term. And my child is a slow learner. And and you know, with with Google, all the parents and the teachers have been uh, you know, good experts in uh, diagnosing, and uh, they would name them. Achha, my child is a slow learner. My child is dyslexic. My child is this. You know. Mm. But what is the difference between a dyslexic and a and a slow learner? Is uh, if I am naming someone as dyslexic, I'm telling that that child is having the intelligence level into average to above average. Right, right. But at the same time, the slow learner will have his intellectual capability in the below average. So the intervention completely changes. Got it. You got my point. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah. A, it's completely different. Totally. And uh, if I am, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting it correctly, but would you agree that with early intervention, we can prevent a learning difficulty from becoming a learning disorder? See, um, irrespective of we term any name, you know, I would rather feel that anything which is identified earlier, we have more time to work on the skill. Right. Right. So if I talk about my son, my child was uh, diagnosed at four and a half, right? Now, because he was diagnosed at four and a half and we did a lot of intervention, you know, we were on to that. Though he was severely dyslexic, he is doing law right now. Well, you know, you, you see that. So uh, I feel the early identification or early diagnosis will definitely help the child to bridge the gap, irrespective of the words we use. Definitely, we are there. We are going to help the child positively. All right. Definitely. Okay. We are running short of time. So I'll take one last question. And uh, so what are some of the interventions that can be used to improve the focus and attention of children, Dr. Deepa? A lot of parents have asked us this. I know, I know. So that is where I was I was sharing that if a child is facing attention or focus issues, we can use a lot of sensory integration therapy, you know, which consists of uh, brain gym and learning gym exercises. Right. Right. You also use um, meditation. You can use yoga. We had a group of Surya Namaskar, which actually, you know, on the res uh, we were doing a small research when we were working with the school kids. And uh, we had a group who was doing Surya Namaskar and we had a group who was not doing Surya Namaskar. There was a vast difference in enhancing their attention span uh, for children who were doing Surya Namaskar. You know, so, but again, with ADD, ADHD, I, I shared, you know, you have to have either, is the child inattentive, is the child impulsive, or is the child hyperactive? You know, but as a whole, Sensory integration therapy with brain gym, learning gym would definitely help. Wow. There's a lot of exercise, a lot of exercises, you know, there. So you can just start doing this. is all doable. It's a toe walk, a heel walk, a zigzag walk, a duck walk, a kangaroo walk. You know, again, you're actually engaging a child in a playful manner. Right, 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 right. 
that's so good to hear uh, dr deepa this was such a fulfilling session and so informative i'm pretty sure all of the attendees who have joined us today would be benefiting a lot from uh, the so. advices I you shared so. and from your own experience you know of being a mom to a dyslexic son i'm so proud and the story is so inspiring that your son is doing law now just because he was diagnosed early and yeah. Uh, so yeah early intervention really helps and this is a living example here today that we are witnessing so dear attendees as soon as this webinar ends you would be redirected to the registration page of the next webinar from the ability series so in case you are interested please do register and also uh, i'm pretty sure uh, our team members must have shared the link to the checklist don't worry if you haven't received it we would also be sharing it via email with all of you who have registered for the webinar thank you so much for joining us today and this calls the end of the session please don't forget to share your feedback with us via the feedback form link thank you so much for joining us thank you dr deepa you have been an amazing host and an thank amazing so session much. conductor thank you so much thank you everyone